your texture artist this is something you're going to have to get used to doing all the time i'll be in public and i'll see a fun thing that i like the look of or i'm interested in in a wall or a floor or a bush or a tree or something and in this case actually while i was filming this someone stopped me and said you know what am i doing and i had to respond sir please i'm a texture artist i understand what i'm doing and what I am interested in in this one is the fact that we have two blocks of sidewalk street here. And you can see this detail. The reason I'm picking this is because it's a very obvious example of this. In one example, we have these cracks on the tile and they run and then they actually end where the tiles switch and it continues somewhere different. And on the right, we have the opposite. We have the crack continue on from one tile to the next. This is something you're gonna to wanna to duplicate in a lot of your graphs. It can be detail on a marble marble tile floor or on wood planks. The cracks are a really simple example of this where you're gonna either want damage or detail to continue over the border of a tile or to stop at the edge of a tile. And it really just depends if you're doing damage. If damage happened to that floor after it was built, you would expect the damage to stretch over top of the tiles from tile to tile, just crack all over the place or if each of those tiles was individually damaged beforehand or have some sort of specific detail. Again, marble floor is a good example. All of those marble tiles come from a different place in the stone, so they all have a slightly different pattern. You wouldn't want that pattern to carry on over from one tile to the next. And this is something I see a lot in student work at the beginning is that they don't pay attention to this specific thing. This is very easy to fix and to build options for. We're gonna look at that today. Let's get to the graph. So I quickly whipped up this little example in Substance Designer so we can see what we're talking about here. In this example, I've made a marble floor. It's about five by five. And it's got two types of detail here. It's got the actual pattern of the marble, like the veins, and then the cracks that are represent damage to the tiles. Now you may want one or, one or both of these to not continue over an edge border. In this case, they both do. So for instance, the vein of the marble pattern here, it just continues from one tile to the next, which looks very bad. This one you probably always want to break. The only time I can think of this is sometimes, like uh, walking around Vancouver, I'll see this. Sometimes they'll lay out big sheets of clay on a sidewalk and then stamp it in with a brick pattern. I'm assuming because it's cheap, it definitely looks cheap. Um, so I don't think it looks good in our materials for the most part, but there might be cases where you do want it. The damage in this case, the cracks, is a little bit more up to interpretation. Again, depending on when the damage happened, if there was a big impact on this after all the tiles had been laid out, I can imagine damage crossing over uh, borders of tiles like it did in our example of the sidewalk. However, sometimes you might want there to be damage per tile and we want that to break along the intersection of the tiles. So I bring everything up here so I can just fix it. And now you see it's really cool. Those veins don't cross over. Right in this case, we have the detail that veining come here. It just ends in the intersection. It isn't continued on the neighboring tile to the right. Same thing here. We get completely different marbling on one section than we do on the other, which adds a lot. Makes it look way, way better, in my opinion. In this case, I have the cracks doing it as well. Again, that's up to you. And depending on the material, you may want one, you may want the other. So let's hop into a new graph and we'll build this from scratch. So I have a new graph with just the same five by five tiles. And the thing we need to discuss first to understand what we're going to do here is just how a warp works. We talked about this a little bit um, in our slope blur video, but it's worth just going over to make sure you understand how this works. So what a warp does is just take a shape, input, grayscale, texture, whatever. I'm just going to make a disc in this case and it's going to move along a direction we supply it in the gradient input. So we print this up. We're telling this object, I want you to move in the direction of that gradient input. You can think of it as drawing a line between the white and black areas of this texture. So in this case, it's just moving vertically and the strength of the warp controls how much it moves. That's the simplest warp. A directional warp is a little different and that's really what we're gonna make use of here. So the directional warp, we don't specify the angle with an intensity input, like we or with the gradient input, like we did on the warp. 
Instead, we just tell it what angle to go on the node and the intensity input or the second input here is no longer about supplying a direction and more about uh, supplying an intensity for that warp. So for example, if we just plugged white into the intensity input, we're just saying, hey, go at full strength. So you can see we're supplying a direction on the warp angle now and an intensity. So I'll put this really high. And then this intensity input just acts as a mask, right? So if we set this to black, it actually wouldn't move at all, regardless of how strong this is, which is really interesting when we have something other than just a flat color in here. If we have something like a gradient, that's really cool. So the whole disk is being, I'll put it right on a 45, is being moved in the 45 degree direction here, quite at a high intensity, but it's moving less at the bottom than it is at the top because we have this mask saying, hey, where I have a darker value here, I want you to multiply that against the intensity and warp less. And up here, I want you to warp more. Really cool. That's really the difference between these. With a warp, you have just a strength and then you supply a direction in the gradient. With a directional warp, you have more control. You control the angle with just the angle slider, the intensity on intensity slider, and then you have the ability to vary up the intensity with an image input. Where this is important for us is that if we have an exact change in luminance value really suddenly, it actually tears our texture in half. Right, because we're saying, hey, up here, I want you to warp at full strength and here I want you to not warp at all. And so our sphere gets sheared in half, right? Or our disc rather, gets sheared in two along that intersection. And that's gonna be really important for us to handle all of that detail in the features we wanna make on this uh, marble floor. Because essentially what we need is a different grayscale value on each tile so that each piece of detail moves a different amount in the directional warp. Um, we're gonna need flood fills for this. If you haven't seen it, we have a video on flood fill up here. It's probably worth watching if you haven't seen it now because I'm just gonna blow through this. I'm going to do our normal the curvature trick on our floor. So give me a normal map and then a curvature sobel. Then I'm going to histogram scan this 50 plus one and then feather it in from there. Might need a bit more just to get rid of those squigglies. There you go. We get a flood fill. And then we just need a flood fill to random grayscale. And that just gives us a different intensity for our warp per tile. We'll close up the gap between all of our random grayscale values by just using a distance. This goes into source. Whatever went into the flood fill goes into mask. We close that up. Now we just have a random. The reason why you'd want to do this instead of doing something like this, I guess in this case we can, but later on we might not be able to depending on what happens back here. So it's better to do it separately after the fact. And then we just need a detail. So a thing I like to do to get just like a quick marble going is just to take a cloud, plug it into itself and set this really high and you get this kind of cool water moisture noise I really like. So if we were just to lay this over top of our color, our base color rather, so I'll just add sub this on really low intensity. This is that first example where the detail just crosses over from one tile to the next. We don't necessarily like that, right? Like that's really <laughs> chintzy looking. It looks like just Ikea flooring. But all we have to do is plug this directional warp into another one and give it our random grayscale values. And you can see, put this number really high, it just rips it apart because all of these textures, and just to visualize it, I'm gonna take our random grayscale color and overlay it just so you can see. Set to overlay. All of the dark tiles, well, actually let's do multiplied, it's better. The darkest tiles are gonna warp way slower. 
you will see it here. This number really high, I'll put it to like 300. So you can see these tiles that are white move really quickly. And the tiles that are darker move comparatively slower. And since the difference between the two areas is like of a pixel, right? We just go from one value to the next, it shreds it apart. So pretty neat. And this solves that issue for us. We can take this, overlay that, and we have non-continuity from piece to piece. Pretty sweet. Same thing with our cracks. We can grab our cells. We're gonna do kind of a cheapo one here. Edge detect. Uh, I like a bit of roundness on these. Bevel them. Auto level. Same thing, we could just, I'm gonna put my flood fills over here. Rearrange this a bit. Graph tidiness is huge and you wanna get good at it. Multiply this onto our height map. However, we don't want our flood fill to change from this guy. So we have the cracks just continuing over our edges and indiscriminately, but if we wanted to, same thing. We could directionally warp this by our random grayscale map. Set it really high, and there we go. Pretty slick. So that's really it. That's the core fundamentals of it. We just want that texture to be warped in different intensities right next to each other so that they end up ripping in half. There's one more thing you can do to make this a little bit better in my opinion. Because the one thing I'm not crazy about about the directional warp is we're only ever moving the texture in one direction. And you end up getting repetition more often, I find. Right? Because again, the directional warp, we have to specify which direction everything's moving in. And because of that, you can see it here. Even though they're all moving at different speeds, they're all moving to the top left. You can make it so they all move in random directions. And for that, you need a vector warp. We're gonna get into vector warps and vector morphs in a different video. But very quickly for now, all you have to know is that instead of supplying a grayscale value to determine how intense the warp is, we're gonna apply a random color, which will determine which direction to warp in. So I'll get a vector warp grayscale, plug in our shapes. So we'll take our cracks in this example. And we need a random color here. We have our flood already. I need a flood fill to random color. That's fine. Get a distance and plug him into the vector map. And you'll see with this guy, it scrambles in all sorts of different directions, which to me ends up feeling a lot better and I tend to get less repetition, less weird tiling. So I like this better. Again, we'll get more into this node in particular because it's really, really cool. But really, we're just supplying it a vector map. You can think of all these colors as a random direction in 360 degrees, as well as in and out, but the in and out doesn't matter much right now. We're only caring about the X and Y. But we'll talk much more about that later. I would almost always recommend using the flow field random color into a vector warp instead of a random grayscale into a directional warp. I just like the result better. If you like the result better, like this video better, please. <laughs> and if you like the video best, uh, consider subscribing. It's really helpful. Um, I'm really enjoying it so far. It's been really nice. In the comments, leave anything about how this was helpful for you or link. What I'd love to see is more artwork. People are starting to send me stuff they're making, which is really cool. You can send it to me here in, uh, on YouTube. You can send it to me on ArtStation, whatever you want. I'd love to see how it's helping people. Um, but that's it for today, and we'll see you guys next time.